This is Lou Steer from ASP Gallery and with me is Scott Seabold from New York City and we're in Chrissy Cotter Gallery right now with Scott's amazing paper sculpture. Hi Scott. Hi, how are you? Can you, can you tell me um, how you come to uh, think of this idea for your sculpture? Well, um, the, it's basically a kind of a structural version of what I've been doing in my paint. Um, and I've been convincing myself for years in my studio about what the paintings are about. And in coming here to um, Sydney on the um, exchange you know, with the artist residency, uh, I was able to work with um, other people and kind of construct these things. And wondering if I could convince other people of what I've convinced myself of in the studio and kind of investigate the idea of these forms in really in three dimensions as opposed to kind of representing sort of them in three dimensions on the canvas. Have you ever done any three dimensional work before? Not of substance. Not of, I mean, I've played around with the idea of it, but it's mostly been, interestingly enough, reference back to the paintings again. And this may well be that as well. It may be informing. Um, but as, no, I've never really made substantial sculpture before. And uh, you, you did this work with the help of the Dutch Human Shape. What was their involvement? Um, interesting. Um, they uh, basically, I was fishing around for a group of people uh, who had experience in life. Now, the younger side. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I teach at a, a college level, high school level, and uh, I wanted a kind of a more mature group, but then not per, per se artists. My ego may not be that strong to handle that. Um, so I wanted some people with enthusiastic, uh, with enthusiasm, um, but maybe not a, a, a lot of immediate drawing skill. So um, the idea that they'd meet on Wednesdays and then I would go and work with them. We started, I have, I'll come up here for a quick second. Um, to plop down in front of them, there were like about 15 of them at a long table and I put all this string down in front of them. And it just plopped it down. And uh, then they would uh, basically uh, start to draw in line and then draw in two dimensions. And then we turn the lights off or very down so there was shadows. And then they learned, or some already knew, as you can see, there's some quality in the drawings that looked like people had drawn before, and other people were kind of first timers. So, and then at the very end, it was drawing them. So they touched each person's drawing, touched the other one, so it became a long piece. And then I came back a second time, and we took this drawing and made it into three dimensional form with paper. Um, and then the final was that those pieces of paper were a little too thin, and then we went into paper plaiting or, or braiding uh, to make them more substantive, and then they became master braiders. So there was a so this a lot of this wouldn't have been done without that for sure. This a lot of this. Have you often done collaborative work in the past? Not with my work, but I work with um, maybe Sino Rio Gallery in the city that is about social issues, and I work collaboratively as kind of a, I don't want to use the curator word because I'm not that, but in putting together exhibitions and, and, and themes. Uh, so I do work socially, but I don't usually bring in my studio. So this was a chance to leave the country safely <laughs> and do this in, in some place else and bring my studio into a more social situation. So um, so I, I've worked and being a teacher and that kind of thing, but my studio usually doesn't get social and so at least this time it does. Can you tell us something about your art practice in the States? Um, yeah, it's pretty much, I have a studio, I have a wonderful cat who keeps me regular. If you think you're not getting to your studio enough, get a cat. And you have to go there every day, no matter what. You know. um, but basically, it's, um, for the most part, it's um, working on these canvases that you'll see that are um, drop cloths. And uh, they're basically large pieces of fabrics. And uh, I usually have, I'm pretty physical when I make the work. Um, but they're both about knots in the sense of being physical knots and also mental knots. Uh, knots that happen uh, in our lives, uh, conversational knots, conversation relationship knots, um, when you're making too much trouble out of something. Um, and I, in my studio, I make a lot of trouble first, a lot of big mess, and then I ended up trying to get rid of the knots in my work, and I don't mean that physically, but I mean that kind of mentally, until there's no knots in the work, the work is done. So it's, it works in a lot of ways. And it tries to keep my life clean too, because you know, if, uh, if I'm not getting along with other people, I have knots in my life. I'm trying to keep those out of the picture. So. Are you um, 
Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Um, I came here with two boxes of stuff to make art with and a roll of canvas. Um, the two drawings up there I was able to make with pencil and the canvas. And then I had no idea what I was going to make out of this. So I went to Reverse Garbage, which I have a big thank you to because they were gratis for these nine rolls of paper that took. Um, I got those rolls of paper and I found a bag of rubber bands in the back and all the wiring that Chris and Cotter Gallery has. Um, so uh, the reason I, this is all, I didn't bring it, you know, I found it. And I find that using limited materials is wondrous. It gives me a chance to reflect back and not say, oh, I can go get, or I could use twine, or I could use tape, or I could use something else, go get something else. But just given the stuff that you have, um, a lot of it, <laughs> but it's wonderful. And it's been, and it, like, I could go out and get rope, and I could do this with that, but having just these rubber bands and only the wires and white paper was a limitation that is fruitful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I worked with an artist who was installing here, he says, I'm gonna go out and get some twine. I said, no. Let's stay here. We got enough rubber bands. Let's do it. And uh, so it became, you know, that limitation sometimes is uh, a, lot, a big horizon to work with. So. Mm -hmm. And finally, my last question is, how do you like Sydney? I like it a lot. Um, I've been nice enough. I was given to by Art Cycle um, here in uh, Sydney. Uh, they've been nice enough to lend me a bike, and I've been able to get around. And uh, I, I've been, I've got a visit. I've only been able to go out to some places only once, like the Gallery of New South Wales and the Contemporary. Um, but it's manageable and it's, uh, as a cyclist, it's uh, challenging um, because we have, you guys are pretty close lanes. Um, but it's been good, people have been very friendly. Um, you guys do drive by the wrong side of the street. It's okay. <laughs> but it's very nice. There's a lot of artist support here that I'm seeing, at least here um, in the inner west. And there seems to be a lot of support for each other and everybody kind of, you know, a lot of the same faces showing up at uh, openings and people remembering my name while I forget theirs. Um, but that's that's really good. I mean, that's something that we don't find enough of in Manhattan because it's there's a lot to do, I guess, but also there's not as much uh, artist run spaces as uh, there used to be. It's, it's just a little, real estate's a little hot. Brooklyn's probably the only place you're finding that these things. So, what do artists do there if they uh, don't have artist run spaces? But uh, there's a lot of commercial stuff opening up. It's commercial viability, or um, you know, trying to get out of the city and showing in Philadelphia and showing in Baltimore. New York State and Connecticut and Boston, you know, so a lot of people showing outside of the city. But basically it's, people are, a lot of people are opening up commercial galleries. But that, that means that the pressure's on for sales and there's a lot of, uh, of, of work for that. No gallery rentals, but you've got a lot of volume for, um, you know, getting your stuff out there and showing. They're quick, sometimes only two weeks, so you have uh, a show, they're happening a lot quicker, especially in Brooklyn, happening like every two weeks. Just boom, 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 turnover, so. Yeah, and do you find that the pressure to be commercial has changed your work? Um, I wish I could say that it had, that I was just like, I don't have any work left because it's just been going up and I have to make so much work that, uh, but not, not particularly. I mean, the main thing is that, um, like somebody was saying it today, that having the ability to have somebody know that you're known for a certain type of work is both refreshing and constraining. Um, that the commercial side likes to know that they can depend on you for not really altering because when they have something coming up or they have a client, they can ring you up and they can see your site and say, or just say you, they still have something in the racks that's yours. Um, but the other side uh, is that there's uh, not being, having any representation feels like you're kind of farting in the wind, you know, there's nobody really paying attention. So you're caught between two sides. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Well, I do want to thank um, Merrickville and Sydney for having these uh, artists in residence programs. Most of them, the idea that they put me up, um, give me a place to work right over there in the camp, art camp or whatever it's called, and a chance to show here is, I mean, they could cook my food, but, uh, but, I've, been, but I've been learning all about uh, barramundi fish and things like that, but it's been really nice that the council's been so good um, to, uh, to offer this. So I'm um, spreading the word. Thank you very much. Thank Scott you very Sleepball. much. Thank you. Yeah, I ran actually. Uh...